Okay, today we're going to do Einstein notation and convolutional neural networks. So Einstein notation was introduced by Einstein in order to have a compact way of writing the equations of general relativity. And in general relativity, you know, you don't have vector fields. You've got this complex, um, sophisticated metric on space-time being curved, and you get these tensors with many indices. So in deep learning, we also have to deal with tensors with many indices. And what I'm going to do in this class is use Einstein notation. And all that means is that I'm going to write out all the indices always. And I'm not going to use compact matrix notation. And there's, this, there's a sort of conflict between the frameworks um, and the Einstein notation, because often the frameworks why you call it call it's called you know, multi, you know mat multi, or, multiply a matrix and you give it two matrices and you don't write the indices out, you just give it the matrix names. So there's a bit of a tension between the notation that's useful perceptually and uh, what the frameworks tend to do. People tend to write papers using framework notation without the indices and it drives me crazy. Um, Okay, why, what are the advantages of always writing out all the indices? Well, one big advantage is that um, when you write out the indices, you can give the indices numeric uh, um, symbolic meaning, right? I can say this is a neuron index, this is the batch index, this is the X and Y index, and I give them all names, and you know what, it, what the index means. This is the batch, this is the neuron. Um, and so, for example, this is the BG, this is um, a BGG network, and if you look at uh, layers in this network, what this network is doing is computing layers. A layer is this three-dimensional box uh, drawn here. So this says, uh, and what this box is going to have actually four indices. There's a batch index, so you're going to get a different run of this whole network for each batch element. So on, in the implementation, you, you have one tensor that has a batch index. Then you have spatial indices, x and y. So at the input layer, we've got spatial x and y, um, and we've got a batch of images. And we also have, it's a color image, so we also have RGB, a number for each of the red, green, blue channels. So um, there's a batch index, a spatial index, and I'm going to call this a neuron index by a use of notation. I think if I talk about the visual cortex and neurons, it's going to be easier for, to understand just because the, the language somehow is more natural. Okay, so each layer has a shape, a batch index, a position, XY position you're at in that layer, and a neuron at that layer. So, um, at, at each layer, in each position, you have a little bundle of neurons. And each one of those neurons has a response. And what this tel tensor is telling you is for batch B, at position XY, and neuron N, what is the response, now it's a number, of neuron N at that batch and that position. Okay, so this layer has four indices. Um, <clears throat> So, as I said, this writing it out with all the indices, not just writing L, um, because these, we have these mnemonic names or mnemonic letters for the indices, you don't really have to write it out this way. You don't have to remember the order, right? The order is somewhat arbitrary. Right? You don't have to remember which is the first index. Um, okay, now I'm going to modify Einstein notation a little bit. And I haven't actually told you what Einstein's innovation is, but I will in a moment. Um, I'm going to modify it a little bit, and I will use lowercase letters for what I just said. So when I use lowercase letters on all the indices, I'm talking about a number, like a matrix. You get the two indices, you get a number. If I do all the indices, you've got a number. But if I do it, use a capital letter, I'm talking about a slice. So a slice in the sense of NumPy. So here we're going to have a batch, we're talking about a particular batch, particular place in this layer, particular xy coordinates in the layer, but I'm going to talk about the vector of neuron responses at that place. So when I use a capital letter, I'm talking about the vector, and that's a slice of the tensor. Um, I can also use, if I wrote, write lowercase b, uppercase for the rest, 
then I'm talking about an entire layer, an entire tensor, x, y, n tensor, but for only for batch element b. Right, so if I, and, that, and that's sort of hidden in this case convention. Um, now, NumPy and um, most frameworks use C order, row major, in laying out the uh, tensor in memory. So this is relevant. There was a question the other day about memory hierarchy. This is relevant for efficient memory access. Um, so if I write um, B, X, Y, N, it turns out that the memory for this tensor is laid out in such a way that this vector is in a contiguous block of memory. Right, the last index, the last index is, is, is ranging over a contiguous block of memory. If I write B and this, this layer is in a contiguous block of memory. So each layer, each batch element has its own block of memory if, if the order is in this order. Um, that made any sense? And that's important because? Because if you do, um, let's say you want to do a weight of vector vector product, if it's contiguous memory, there's almost certainly machine instruction, which is way out. But if it's not contiguous memory, it's got chase pointers. Uh, can I ask about like the like, shapes of L B X Y capital N and L B capital S capital Y capital N? Because right. I, I feel like so the the first expression denotes batch B position X position Y, and then how many neurons are there? I, I, I sort of am visualizing only one. But what happens in the actual implementation is that we've got something like 100 neurons at X X Y. Okay. So you add the position. We're going to have 100 neurons. Even if we fix the batch to, to just one batch? Even if we fix the batch to one batch and fix the position to one position, we still have 100 neurons at that position. So is the second uh, tensor then like a 3 d tensor? The second tensor with, with, the little, with the batch element given is a 3D. It's a 3D okay. perverted tensor. And by convention, the batch index is first, so that the batch element is always in continuous number. Okay, here's what here's what Einstein, here's what Einstein the convention Einstein actually introduced, and that is um, repeated indices. So the, the Einstein introduced the convention that if I repeat an index, it's an implicit summation. So let's go through this carefully. So this is standard notation using a weight matrix and a vector. Right? So I can multiply a, a matrix times a vector, and I get a vector. Right? Everyone's seen that. <coughs> Standard notation. Now, you've all probably learned to visualize that weight matrix as a two-dimensional array of numbers. You pull out a row, you rotate it, you multiply it by a column vector, you add it up, and that gives you one component of the... Right? I've never been... Ha I've been very... My whole life, I've been... What? Um, <laughs> And I've been told the mathematicians will tell you that's a bad habit. So there's this other way of writing it, which is what, if you want the ith component of the output vector y, right? That's what we want y. We're computing y. So to compute y, I need to compute each of its components. It's a vector. So to compute the ith component, I take the sum over j of this matrix weight times xj. So if I take the sum over j, that's effectively taking an inner product between a certain row of that matrix and this x vector. Um, and then the way, then the convention is, if I use a convention I'm going to use in this course is if I use a capital letter and I repeat it, a repeated capital letter is being summed over. Right, so you can think of this as a as a vector vector inner product, I'm summing over j, where I'm summing, I'm taking the inner product of this vector for i fixed with this vector for x. And just to give another example, you've probably seen this notation, right, which is you multiply a vector times the um, left hand side of a matrix. 
And if you write that, you can also write that out as a sum. But now, instead of summing over um, the right index of W, you need to sum over the left index of W. Right, so this is a sum over the left index of W, the row index. And I write, can write that by repeating the I here. And now there's no transpose. Transpose is gone. Right, because you don't need transpose anymore. So when we're doing matrix matrix vector multiplication, you can't just commute. But with Einstein notation, we can. Like if, once we've as written, long as, as if, if, if you have a mnemonic name for the indices and you write them in the other order, you're okay. Got it. Okay. So now we're going to talk about convolution, and we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks. So what's happening in this VGG network is I've got a bunch of these layers, uh, and each layer is being computed from the layer before it. Okay, and each one of these layers has the shape I just showed you. And so what I'm going to do now is tell you what's happening, what is a convolution, what's happening between two of these black boxes. Each of these boxes is 50, in this se sequence of layers, each of these boxes has x, y dimensions of 56, and 256 neurons at each position. Right? So 56 by 56 by 256. Okay. Convolution. Convolutional neural networks. So I'm going to continue to use visual cortex language just because I think it makes it easier to parse. So think of this. This is a layer. I'm sorry. This is a layer, and this is a layer. And I'm going to compute this layer from this layer. Okay, now, in, what is this layer? This layer has x, y little boxes. In each little box, I've got some number of neurons, maybe 256 neurons. All right, so there's a bunch of neurons here. Each neuron now, in a convolutional neural network, has a receptive field. So it's looking back at the previous layer in the visual cortex, but not at one place. It's looking back at a, at a field in the previous layer of the visual cortex. And it's going to compute a response. Each neuron is going to compute a response of that neuron computed from the field it's looking at in the previous layer. And it's, that field it's looking at in the previous layer is going to have a non-trivial spatial um, uh, field. And it's also going to have many neurons at each position in that field. And this neuron is going to look at all those positions and all those neurons and figure out what its response is. Okay, so the idea is there's a the neuron that's being computed, we're computing one neuron, that neuron is still going to be a linear threshold neuron. Right, so it's going to take a weighted sum of its inputs, compare it to a threshold, and produce a response through a ReLU or a sigmoid or something. Okay, so what are its inputs? Where its inputs are everything in its receptive field and all the neurons in its receptive field. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this out in Einstein notation, right? So what I'm computing is the value, the response value of an, an output neuron. So I'm computing at a, at a batch and an xy position, and for a particular output neuron, I'm computing that neuron's response. Okay, and I do that. Now if I'm gonna write that, what I'm writing is the linear threshold function that is that neuron. So it's got an activation function, and it's going to take a weighted sum over this receptive field. A weighted sum over the receptive field of a weight times the value in the receptive field. So the weight is pulled from this tensor called the kernel. And that kernel is used for every neuron at every position. We're going to use the same kernel. And that is a weight tensor. Yeah. So the, the kernel here doesn't have a batch index, so are we not learning the kernel? Or? That's an excellent point. The kernel now is a parameter of the model. And we're not learning it. I'm mean, sorry, we are learning it, but we're but it has it doesn't have a batch index. The parameter of the model is the same model parameter for each batch element. Each batch element is seeing the same model. We, we're, we're going to sum up gradients over all the batch to get a gradient on the kernel. And then we'll take a gradient SGD step on the kernel. Yeah. 
where it says X plus uh, cap delta capital X, is that delta X, delta capital X displaced by the constant X? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, didn't, I haven't quite got to that second line yet. Right, so, so let's go through the second line. So the kernel is, is parameters of the model. And the kernel is going to be indexed by um, the output neuron that it's computing. So um, I think I said something wrong. The kernel is giving a different value for each, different weights for each output neuron. Right, so the kernel is going to give a weight, it's going to give a weight tensor for this particular output neuron. So the kernel has all these indices. What neuron am I computing? Right, which of these 256 neurons am I computing? Each one of those neurons at all the positions is going to, each, each position is going to have an N out neuron. And you can say, well, the N out neuron at this position is using the same weights as, the, as a particular N out position at that N out neuron at that other position. OK. So there's an N, a neuron out index. Then there's, uh, you have to get the receptive field. So the elements of the receptive field are determined by taking deviations from X and Y to get the receptive field. So delta X and delta Y are going to be deviations from the position that we're computing in the neuron. And I'm going to sum over all those deviations. And in this picture, you want to think of those deviations as possibly negative. Right? You can go left or right or up or down from in its receptive field from the center position. OK, so um, I'm going to sum over all the changes, all the variations from the position I'm at. Um, uh, and a sum over all the input neurons. So you're looking at all the positions and all the input neurons. And you're getting a value uh, centered <coughs> at the position that I'm computing for, right, at this x and y. I'm computing centered at x and y looking at the neighborhood around X and Y for the receptive field. I'm looking um, at all of the input neurons at that position, and I'm summing over all delta X, delta Y, and input neurons. And I'm getting a value for X, Y, and a particular output neuron. This making sense. I think I stumbled over a lot of words there. See people looking a little confused. Yeah. Uh, so if the glue loop thing, each neuron will have like five, uh, five bundle. Like one position will have <coughs> one neuron. Will those five neurons all be calculated here? So to calculate, so let me say it. Let me say it slowly and see if I can say it correctly. Calculate the response of a neuron in the next layer. Right? There are going to be many neurons at that position in the next layer. I take a weight matrix, I take a set of weights specific to that neuron. And I'm going to take a weighted sum of, of neuron responses in this, in this blue receptive field. And I'm, there's going to be a weight for each input neuron at each position in the receptive field. So this kernel assigns a weight for when I'm computing n out, and it assigns a weight to each position in the receptive field and each neuron in the receptive field. And I'm taking a sum to compute n out. I'm taking a sum over all positions and all neurons in the receptive field. Yeah. So does n out specify the center of the receptive field? X, Y, right here. Oh, sorry. Okay. X, Y, right there is specifying the center. Compute the neuron, the N out at this, at this position. I sum over the variant, I sum over all the receptive field by taking delta X and delta Y and adding it to that position. Yeah. Are we taking the dot product in the equation um, that's the for each? So K something, L, L something. That's the dot product then? Well, it's, I'm trying to avoid the thinking about it as a dot product. Um, I, I want to think about it as a, as a sum. Right? Okay. It's a sum over all places in the receptive field and all neurons in the receptive field that will wait for that place in that neuron, add them up, 
compared to your threshold. And the threshold just depends on the output neuron. Why are we not using an L as like the mix of the Why are we separate? Because I'm focused on, okay, so what's going to happen in a real CNN is each layer has a, a kernel. And each layer has a different kernel. So, so I should have said, yeah, I should have said kernel sub L plus one. You're right. So notably, the kernel does not have indices for B, X, or Y. So if I understand right, the kernel is shared across all batch inputs and across all positions. Um, so exactly. like, right. yeah, neuron three in this X, Y position is going to have the same kernel as neuron three, three in a different position. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I may have missed this. Why doesn't the bias have an X, Y kernel? So. Because we're, we're using the same parameters at every place. Okay. So the bias is going to be the same no matter where we are. What is the specific meaning of an out and a? So we've got two layers. We're computing one layer from the previous layer. And out is arranging over neurons at a particular place in the output layer. And, and in is ranging over neurons in a particular place in the input layer. And those don't have to be the same dimension. I can be computing 100 neurons in the next layer from 50 neurons in the previous layer. So you're getting a weight for each pair of neurons. Okay. But like, K is not, K is like, it's like, like it's, you should not cons like, uh, restrict K with respect to an out and in, but rather like to each layer, right? Well, that was the, there was a, I mean, there's a different K. K really should be subscriptive with L plus one. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different K at each, at each, at each layer. Yeah, this means that subsequent layers, uh, as in like after you apply this compilation, the layers get smaller, right? Like in terms of this doesn't system. imply that, but it, they do. Um, they diminish by the size of how wide your kernel is, how tall your kernel is. Well, you can take any two, for each two layers, I can decide how many how many neurons do I want at each place in this layer, and how many neurons do I want at each place in this layer, and there's no constraint. You can go up, you can go down. Um, typically what happens, I think I might have said it wrong, typically what happens is the spatial dimensions go down, but the neuron counts go up, so the number of numbers in each layer is held fairly constant. <coughs> The size of the kernel for each layer, is that also like a hyperparameter that we control, or is that also learned as? Uh, well, the size of the kernel is certainly determined by the dimensions of the, well, except the, the size of the receptive field. It's, it's completely layer specific. So you have a different kernel at each layer, and it can be arbitrary. So, confirm the K is a vector of size N in I don't like that word. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a tensor of shape, uh, and, and and then um, for every delta x and delta y, we're summing over all of the delta x and delta y. So the, the sum. Of well, if you look at the last this last equation, right? Yes. Yes. What I, what's in capital here is what's being summed over. Hmm. That's what's being summed over. Every 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 place I can get to in the receptive field. And every neuron in the receptive field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it so, so? So are those neurons kind of correspond roughly to future maps? Is that the way to think people about will, it? Yeah, people will call them future maps. Okay. And I and I people. But for me, if I say neuron, somehow it helps parsing okay. the yeah. right. So just to be clear, so the dependence on the neuron, in particular the output neuron. There's a weight and bias dependency on the like where we are in the in that output image, for example, at the i coordinate will have a different. Well, we're going to do we're going to do the same weighted sum and bias comparison for each place in the output layer. And so the n out like b of n out in this case means like a bias dependency on that neuron. That neuron, that neuron has weights. That neuron, every neuron is a weighted sum of input values compared to the bias term to the threshold. And 
this is the this is how we're computing n out. So the bias term here is specific to n out. As are the weights. So I understand n in and n out is just the channel number. That's right. I mean, there's no constraint on n in on how how many neurons are placed. So it's, it's basically the channel, right? Say that the channels. I because I, I think yeah yeah right the channel. Also, like, is there an intuition why like they are using two D uh, index X Y instead of like three D things? Besides, like, oh, you, can, you can do three D. Okay. Like, is there a benefit of doing this? Well, I'm gonna. This is came, this, this sort of became very famous in the, for ImageNet. Uh, in, ImageNet is two dimensional images, but you can do video versions. They're you know it's much harder to do a three D kernel computation. So. So delta x, delta y would be like, that's fixed ahead of that. Like how many? Yes. the size of the kernel. If that that is it a 3 by 3 kernel or 5 by 5 kernel? And that's, that's fixed across fixed. layers, so that is also something that changes with layers. That's also something that changes with layers. But not something we train. You don't train the, the dimensions of the kernel. I mean, there are people who do architecture search, but that's a whole different thing. What was the weight for the Is it like, is it like, what was for the computer? Initialized randomly, and then we just do SGD. So we compute the gradient of the loss of the respective kernel, and we learn the kernel. Is there intuition as to why we don't have like XY in the kernel and the, and the bias? Like, could we do it? Could we add XY in there? Well, that would, um, that would make the kernel much bigger. Sure. Right. So typically you use three by three kernels. So delta x and delta y are the ratio of three values. I mean, like the the x y like spatial location, like to allow it to differ across different x y coordinates. Is that it like, just means that the number of weights in your model would be much larger. Okay. And that's a bad thing. Perhaps. That's a bad thing. Yeah. I mean. It, Just a quick question. That, um, for your notation here, what is the index? What is the range of the kernel index? Delta x, delta y. So that's that's depends on the model. So so a three by three kernel, delta x in this picture would be one from minus one zero plus one, and the same with delta y. Early early neural network models would have like seven by seven kernels. Modern models use almost exclusively three by three kernels. Yeah. I guess as a follow up to the size, I mean, so you mentioned that it would uh, start it because of the internet. So, like, if you were to output like what the, the response of the model is at each layer, that like, the, if, let's say you're taking in like a image, you can output like the second layer of like process that convolution. It would get a, it would become a smaller image, and that's why we well, see the, the one thing you notice is in this picture is um, the input image is two twenty four by two twenty four by three. So that's a RGB 224 by 224 picture. The, the next two layers are 224 by 224 by 64. So now there's a 64 neurons at every pixel of the input yeah. image. Right? And then it goes down to 112 by 112, but it doubles the number of neurons. All right? And then it goes down by, it's going down by factors of two in spatial dimension, but up by a factor of two in neurons. So like if you were to, like that, let's say the 120, 112 by 112, you were to output like in like the image, I guess, of how it's processed at that point, it would be a one to one. Just so different. Each just tensor is literally a layer. I mean, sorry, each layer is literally a tensor. Right. So we're. I don't know if that's your question, but there's a there's a tensor for each one of these boxes. Okay, so now we're going to jump to um, CNNs. So this is a good Moore's Law picture. This is the start of the deep revolution. So this is uh, 2011 and 2012, uh, 10, 2010 and 2011. And this is uh, your accuracy. So you've got a million images, you've got a thousand labels. You see an image, you get five guesses. You get it right in five guesses. Um, so this is classification. Um, accuracy at five, or at classification error at five. Um, 
This is before the Deep Revolution. This was in the days of the deformable part model when TTI Chicago was ruling the computer vision. <laughs> and then came along AlexNet, and we get this huge jump. This was the competition where everybody else was still up here, and AlexNet was down at 16%. Um, and then, you know, ten, in, through 2015, say, people kept putting up this chart. Look at you know, look, look at what's happening. Um, this uh, what this picture is supposed to be showing is the increase in depth. How deep are the networks? Right, and there was this big change that we're going to talk about um, probably next time, when suddenly the networks got vastly deeper. Right, there it was 19 layers, 22 layers, suddenly 152 layers. So we, people learned how to train really deep networks. And we'll be talking about that. Okay. Um, PyTorch has a 2D convolution and a 3D convolution um, layer. Um, it's a procedure you call. We talked about the um, how frameworks are, are a programming language. So you call this Conv2D procedure, and it takes these arguments. It takes a lot of arguments. So there's a lot of sort of switches you can play with. Um, uh, it takes an input. This is going to be some layer. And it's going to have some shape. Um, it takes a weight tensor. Um, and, and these shapes are what we've just been talking about. This is just the, um, this is just the kernel. It's going to take a bias tensor. So this is our K and our B. And then I'm going to describe what these other things are. Stride and padding and dilation and groups. So if you go to the PyTorch tutorial or and PyTorch documentation, you can look up. The 2D, this con 2D uh, function in PyTorch. So <laughs> the first thing I want to talk about is padding. So um, I said, you know, you want to think of these delta x and delta y as being um, possibly negative, like minus one to plus one. What, how do you, what do you do at the corner of your input image, right? Because then your minus one is the receptive field is off the image. Um, so what, they, what people do is they pad and they put zeros in there. Um, and that seems to work. It sort of zeroes out the effect of, of a piece of the kernel that's going off the image. So you pad the image to be a little bit bigger. So if you've got a 3 by 3 kernel, we'll add a padding of 1 around the outside. Um, and, and we'll just fill that with zeros. Um, and and that's going to let us do this convolution, preserving the spatial dimensions. Yes. Why don't you have to do two layers of padding? I would imagine that if you do the convolution kernel on the very corner, you might need to. Well, this is a picture of the kernel in the corner. So the kernel's still... in the corner here, and it's over. It's it's off on on its side. It's off on its top. But so this four of the squares are in the image, right? Like the blue is the image. The blue is the image. But what about the case when it's just the one corner of the image, like the instead of having four of them? Oh, I see. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay, I, I get it. Now. Right. You, you can move that orange thing around everywhere. If, if that was a five by five kernel, you would pad it right. too. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Oh, this is, I put this slide in here a while ago. Just, there's a, there's a clever way to do this in NumPy, to add padding. Um, I create a padded tensor, which is all zeros. In NumPy, I can initialize a tensor to zero, and I can give it two dimensions, a width and a height. And I'm, and I, but I make the width two times the padding. And I make the height two times the padding. Then I take a slice of that tensor, which is just the interior, and I set it to the thing I'm adding. So there's this other point to make. Um, in this equation, um, if the input is padded and the output is not padded, then we can just we can actually take delta x and delta y to always be positive. Um, if you're iterating over, you can take x and y to be up in the corner. This is a technicality. 
reducing spatial dimension. Um, so you see in this picture that the spatial dimension is going down. So what, what, how do you set up a convolution that reduces spatial dimension? So this is where striding comes in. So we want to go down. We've got a layer of some dimension. Let's say it's our input layer. We want to produce a layer that's half as big. So when I, want, when I compute a position in the, in the image that's half the spatial dimension, I have to figure out what position in the input image does that correspond to. Okay, so that image is half as big, I've got a point in that image, what position in the input image does it correspond to? Well, it turns out that if I take its xy dimension and multiply them by, by 2, right, so that every time I move one place in the in the smaller image, I'm moving two steps in the bigger image, then that gives me a correspondence that covers the input image. It's, it's getting every other position in the input image. Um, and that's what striding does. So if I say stride 2, it means I'm reducing the image by a factor of 2. And then when I compute the output, um, I first multiply by 2 before taking the delta x and delta y. And notice that if it's if the receptive field is 3 by 3, I'm still looking at the places that are never ever centers of anything because I'm looking at the, a receptive field that's around the place I'm looking at. I'm going to get through these slides a lot faster than I thought. Um, reducing spatial dimension. So this is, this is how it was done back in the day. Um, back in the day, this is uh, it was called max pooling. So what max pooling does, and in this picture, there's max pooling layers. These um, red boxes are max pooling layers. So the way max pooling layers is I want to, com I want to compute one layer from the previous layer. And this is typically done, back in the day, this was typically done in conjunction with reducing the spatial dimension. So when the spatial dimension was reduced, you use a max pooling layer. So we've got a stride of two, typically. So we're reducing spatial dimension. But instead of summing with a kernel, I just take a max. So the intuition behind this was, in the days of the deformable part model, you would have, you'd have an object and the object would be, it's not always in exactly the same configuration, right? A person's hands might be somewhere. So you want to say, um, you want to handle deformation. So you want to say, well, if, I'm, if there's a neuron that's responding to the hand, I don't necessarily know where the hand is. So I take the hand neuron and take it, its maximum response over places the hand might be. Does that make sense? That was the intuition. So this is taking a, a max over the, over the positions of what the hand detector see, says, and you let that be the hand detector at the next level. So it handles deformation. But this isn't really done much anymore. Question? Yeah. So if you go back to the slide of the network side. Yeah. This slide? The network side. Yeah. So we go from 224 to 112, and then we like keep like the x, y dimension becomes half because the stride is set to 2. So if we set it to like 4 or something, with like, so it would become, like, yeah. Okay. And the trade-off is like accuracy or like compute or like how do you decide the stride? Um, there's a lot of empirical play. We'll get to what the modern, what the current conventions are. And it, it just evolved by, you know, what works on the internet. <clears throat> fully connected layers. So if you look at this picture, we've explained um, the input image, you explained how you do a convolution. The red boxes are max pooling. In, this, in the old BGG network, max pooling was always done when you were reducing dimension. Um, and it gets down here to these blue layers. The blue layers are one by one. By four, this first blue layer is one by one by, or actually these two blue layers are one by one by 4,000 neurons. 
much. What's that? What's a one by one convolution with 4,000 neurons? Well, every neuron, the receptive field of every neuron now, is only one place in the image. So the receptive field of a neuron is that place. It has to be, can only be that place. But there are 4,000 neurons at that place. Right? So each neuron at this place is looking at each neuron at the previous place. So this is a multi-layer perceptron. It's just vectors, to use a dirty word. Um, it's just vectors. <laughs> it's just vectors each layer, and there's a weight. When you compute this layer, each component of that has a weight for each value in the previous layer. But it's 4,000. That's a 4,000 by 4,000 matrix. Um, so it turns out that in, this, in, in these early networks, the vast majority of weights were in these fully connected layers. They call them fully connected layers. Every, every value here is tied to every value there. But it's just a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and then it goes down to uh, a 1 by 1 by 10,000 um, layer. So I've got, I've got this multi-layer perceptron. It's got 4,000 neurons going to 4,000 neurons, going to 1,000 neurons. Why did I go to 1,000 neurons? Classes. classes. Right, I've got 1,000 classes. Now I've got a number for every class. Now a number for every class can be converted to a probability distribution over the classes via a softmax layer. So the very last orange one is a softmax. And that's giving me the probability of each class. And you take a loss and you take a gradient. Okay, so these are all the parameters. So if I've explained um, what the input layer is, what the weight matrix is, what the bias is, what the stride is, what the padding is, and finally, wow, I'm way ahead of myself. Finally, we have padding and dilation. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't done padding. We finally have dilation and groups. So dilation. Um, this is something we're not going to talk about, but Greg, who's here, um, used dilation in some well-known work. I won't. It's been used here to, to write a prominent paper a long time ago. Colorized images. He, he had something that would take a black and white image and colorize it. And it would make apples red by recognizing that they're apples. Based on the training data. Anyway, um, dilation. I have an input image. And say I'm doing colorization, like Greg was doing. I need to take this input image, I need the output image. I want the output image to be the same dimension as the input image. Right? I want to colorize it. I'm going to, I'm going to produce an, out, an output image of the same dimension. But at the same time, neural networks had this property that they would reduce spatial dimension. So suppose what we want to do is take a network that's reducing spatial dimension, and that network, the whole network, the whole stack, has some receptive field at the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to slide that receptive field over the input image. And as we're sliding it over the input image, it's got some output, and that's going to fill in an image of the same dimension, and it's going to get colorized. Okay, now if you wanted to compute all of the, you know, every placement of that whole neural network, it would be an enormous amount of computation. Am I making sense? But um, it turns out that you don't, that you can do one computation that goes all the way up at the same spatial dimension and get exactly that computation. And the way you do it is when you look back at a layer, instead of taking your receptive field to be sort of localized, you dilate the receptive field, right? So that if the network is getting smaller, at the place where it's smaller, it's actually represented spread out, dilated. And you and you're, you're instead, instead of reducing the spatial dimension, you dilate. And anyway, that's dilation. It's sort of the, the yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
grouping. Um, so <coughs> sometimes these weight matrices, like if you're doing 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, that's a lot of multiples. That's a lot of numbers. So grouping groups the neurons into groups. So suppose I group the neurons into two groups. And group A of the output neurons only looked at group A of the input neurons. And group B of the output neurons only looked at group B of the input neurons. Well, that's two, um, two matrices of half the size. Right? But when I make the matrix half the size, I actually make the number of numbers a quarter. You know, it's n squared numbers in the matrix, it's n by n. So if I, make, if I group them and make the matrices by group, I make the dimensions of the matrix cut in half, but now I have two of them, so I've saved a factor of two. And if I make k groups, I've saved a factor of k. But it means that every neuron's not looking at every neuron. Every neuron's only looking at neurons in its same group. So that's group. Some people are happy, some people are bored. Um, modern trends. So, <clears throat> modern convolutions use 3 by 3 filters. Um, and what's happened is we, we figured out how to make the network so deep that, you know, you don't, that the fact that you're using 3 by 3 filters um, can be... Uh, the sort of receptive field will grow as, as you know, if you look at a neuron, it's using 3 by 3 at the previous layer, but each one of those is using 3 by 3 at the, at the layer below that. So you're getting wider receptive fields through depth. And it's giving you more computation, more chance to do computation. Um, Max Pooling has disappeared, um, and ResNet and ResNet-like architectures are now dominant. So we're going to talk about ResNet and residual connections. Okay, AlexNet. So this is the this is the one that um, started the deep revolution in some sense. Most people point to AlexNet as the as the turning the turning the corner. Um, so this was uh, quite shallow. So again, this is this one is starts at the input um, at the top. And gives class scores at the bottom. It's not worth going through the details. I just want to give you a feeling of the early days. Uh, so this is BGG in 2014. Here's AlexNet. AlexNet, now the input's in the bottom and the softmax is at the top. Um, this is BGG. I think we've been looking at BGG 16 in those pictures. This is just all the layers laid out as layers. Um, the, the blue is the max pooling. This is, this is an interesting beast. This is from Google, called Inception. Um, it, this was, this was uh, appeared about the same time as ResNet, and uh, was one of the first successful, much deeper networks. So <clears throat> what's happening here is we've got this unit here, down here, that's getting repeated again and again in this network, right? So I don't know, what, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine repetitions of this, each with different parameters, right? So I can, I can initialize this thing. Each place I put it, I can initialize it with different parameters. And a problem with depth, <coughs> the fundamental problem with depth is that the gradients get lost. It's really hard to compute the gradient of anything down here when the gradient has to come all the way through all this gubbish under random initialization. And once these things are randomly initialized, it's just, it gets obliterated. So the solution in Google's inception network is to add multiple heads. So what's happening here? You put a softmax right there. That's the final answer that you're going to use when you go to computer evaluation. But you also put a softmax here over the classes. And you also take a loss, a log loss, right there. And you do it here also. So you take a log loss right there. Um, here's a quiz question. If I add three losses at different places in this network, what does it do to the computation time of back prompt? 
correct. You might think, and, and sometimes people mistakenly think, if you have to compute the loss with respect to this, and the loss with respect to this, and the loss with respect to this, you have to do three back props. No, that's not true. You just take the loss to be the sum of these losses. You sort of define the loss to be the sum of these losses. And um, the, the, the gradients that are going back here are just the sum of these two. The gradients that are going back here are the sum of all three. So the back prop is, is still with respect to a single loss function. You just define it to be the sum of these three losses. Okay, here's ResNet. This is the thing that that caught on, basically because it's a much simpler architecture. Um, and it, it, it uncovered a, a much more fundamental phenomenon. Um, and, and that is these residual connections. And we're going to be talking about that. So this is the jump due to ResNet. Um, and then you can carry, I, don't, I never, I stopped keeping track of this at 2020. It was 26. Been reduced to 1.3 by 2020. 